My name is Jennifer Tyrell. I'm the project manager for the ARC ORNL Summer Science Institute. I've been working with the high school students and teachers this week, and we've got some wonderful presentations for you. But before we get started with those, I'd like to recognize some people who are here with us today. We have uh, several family members of the participants in the program who are here today. If you could just stand up for one second. If you're a family member, parents and siblings, thank you. Let's give them a hand. Thank you so much for, for letting your students come do this program. Thank you so much for being here to watch them. Your support means everything to them, so we're so glad to have you here. Um, additionally, helping out with this program, we had four resident teachers who are also here. If Pat, Mary Sue, Billy, and Colt are in the back, if you guys could stand up, we'll give them a hand. They're the ones who really keep this program moving and, and make this happen. They've been taking care of your, your kids all week, or for, for the last two weeks, and they do a fabulous job. We also have in attendance with us today some of the ORNL mentors and facilitators and folks who worked with these people at the National Lab. If you guys could please stand up. Without these folks, we would not have a program. These are the people who make sure that our participants learn something fabulous during their time here. So thank you all, and thank you so much for your support in coming to watch your, your participants present. To keep this short and sweet, when I come up and introduce each group, I'm just gonna tell you uh, which group they worked with at ORNL, and then I'm gonna let them take over and introduce um, their projects. So the first group that we have here uh, worked with the Neutron Sciences Directorate. So we'll bring them up. Good morning. Hopefully you can hear me okay on this microphone. We did not have the opportunity to practice with this. So I might pull out my teacher voice as well as the other two might do the same thing. The very first thing that I would like to do is to introduce our group. Neil Snedeker from Roxbury, New York. Darlene Rutledge from Smithville, Mississippi. And I'm Elena Kilpatrick from Lisbon, Ohio. Our group studied the crystal structure of lysozyme, and we utilized the Visual Molecular Dynamics Laboratory to look further into our structure of the protein lysozyme. The clicker. Sorry. We would first, also, sorry, we would like to thank the ORNL laboratory. We'd also, and most importantly, would like to thank ARC for giving us this opportunity to study here the last two weeks. We would like to thank our mentors, Dr. Flora Meyer, who is unavailable today. Actually, she's watching the Tour de France because she's from France, and they're going by her hometown, so she's looking for her mom and dad, which is cool. We really like that. And then um, Dr. Jeremy... Smith, who is unavailable, but he also assigned his team to us. We'd like to thank that group of people as well. I'm a little nervous, and I want to tell the students, this is my daily job. I present to teachers every single day, and I'm nervous because it's normal. So whatever you do, just take a deep breath and just let it flow. It's okay. I'm nervous. The other thing, and I think the most important, and I'm sorry if I go over our time limit, is that a complete stranger came up to Darlene the other day to recognize just how well behaved our students were at the hotel. A complete stranger. So we're really proud that you were able to keep it together for two weeks for us. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Oh, and lastly, actually, Brian, Dr. Brian Hingerty is here. He was our facilitator. He took time out of his schedule and after knee surgery he's been with us every single day the last two weeks and we're really thankful for his knowledge and input. Thanks Brian. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, this is the basic layout and the basic steps of the project that we were working on and we're just going to briefly uh, go over each step. So we start with the protein. So what is a protein? We eat them in our diet. What is a protein? 
Proteins are large, complex molecules made up of smaller molecules. They're the movers and the shakers of all the major molecules that our body is made of. They are the ones that are doing most of the work. They're made of smaller units called amino acids, and there are 20 different amino acids that make up our body. Now, these 20 amino acids are to proteins like the alphabet is to our language. It is these 20 that are arranged in many different ways to make the more than 40,000 proteins that our body uses. If you look at the basic structure of an amino acid, you'll notice that all of them have that same basic black structure. You have a central carbon uh, and the, the, the arms and the head basically are all the same. It is that shaded part that is slightly different about each one and because of that difference, they all behave differently. There are four levels of protein structure, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary, and I'm going to just briefly go over those before we get into our project. So the primary structure is just when um, the protein rolls off the ribosome, and it's just a long chain of these amino acids. Uh, they're determined by our DNA, and it is that sequence that determines how it's going to behave. The first start, when it first comes off, it starts folding, and those black portions will start hydrogen bonding to itself, and you'll see these structures formed here, the alpha helix and beta sheets. Those are the first <laughs> folded structures. Then those shaded parts that I showed you will start to interact with one another, causing a more compact bonding uh, or folding of the protein. When one of those units that I just described bonds with other units like it, you get a very large, complex molecule that we call the functional protein, and it has a specific job. So in biology, structure determines function. So um, the, the molecules have a particular shape, and therefore they will behave a particular way. And this works like a lock and key. The uh, protein has a very specific shape and will only bond to a specific molecule. Just like everybody may have a key in your pocket, it doesn't open every lock. It has a very specific lock to which it will um, behave. Now we're going to talk about how we crystallize those so we can further study their structure. So I'm going to tell you about the process we took to crystallize our protein lysozyme. First, we started with the protein lysozyme, and it's found in the egg whites of hen eggs. Uh, our, our professor actually had powder form of it, so that was really nice. When you take a look at these pictures, it's very easy to see that it looked like it was a lot of fun. This was my favorite part of the, the activity was doing this, being the scientist in the lab. But you can see that we have a special tray on the screen. Before we began, we started with four solutions. We started with a buffer solution of pH 5, another buffer solution of pH 7, and a protein solution as well as sodium chloride solution. We use limbo plates. That's the name of that special plate. That was pretty neat as well. There's grease on top of each one of those holes. And then we were able to flip a slip cover right over top and create a hanging drop with that. We created those solutions. We took just a teeny tiny little drop of each of those solutions and put it in into a little bridge on the very top to study it underneath the microscope. We did this to crystallize our protein 24 hours later. This was our result. What you see here is a long chain of the protein lysozyme. It's 10 to the 15th structure. So our goal was to individualize or get a single crystal, and every time we got a single crystal, we were very excited. It was so beautiful. That's what we kept saying. So there's our crystals. After we, we found the crystals, we had to prep our crystal to be utilized on the x-ray diffractor machine, which Neil will talk about in a minute. But you could see the tools on the screen. In the upper right-hand corner, you could see how small they are. Underneath, that's a ballpoint pen. That's just how tiny they were. I was not able to use it personally myself. It was very difficult for me. And then on the left-hand side, it's a super delicate procedure. Because it's mostly made of water, it just, the crystal would just shatter instantly. So it was very, very hard. It was like being a neurosurgeon or watching the brain surgeons go. Everything up to this point can be and will be done in high school science laboratory. Our lesson plan reflects this first part. 
This next step can only be done if you have access to a lab or a university because it requires use of something like an X-ray diffractometer. So the X-ray diffractometer up on the screen up here, we mount the crystal right up in here, right through here. This shoots a beam of X-rays through the crystal. As these X-ray photons enter the crystal, they are going to be diffracted around the crystal matrix. These waves, these photons are going to bend around it. The diffracted photons will hit this black screen, which is then going to send an image to the computer, and this can be analyzed for further information. This is the data we got from this. What it shows is the x-rays that have been diffracted. All these dark spots right up here are, the, are where the x-rays hit. The darker the spots, the more the x-rays. If you look at this, you will see a nice curved pattern in these photons. That's showing the diffraction. It's showing that we're getting some pretty good data. If we look at higher resolution data, we look at a lot more of these photons. It's a lot darker and we could see the photons that are at the edge. The closer you are to the edge, the better the image, the better quality data you're going to get. Something like this here, you don't see those individual lines. It's a lot dirtier, it's not as clear. This is showing that there are multiple crystals and our data is not gonna be any good. From here, we send it to a computer and it creates something called an electron density map. This is actually gonna map out where the individual atoms are, where it's the most dense, and since we already know the structure of the individual amino acids, we now map these structures to where we see the highest density in this, and this will create a model of our protein. From here, we use two pieces of software, VMD, the Visual Molecular Dynamics, and NAMD, not another molecular dynamics, and both of these are free open source software that you can download and you can actually visualize the structure of the protein. And this makes it look a little bit nicer. So for those of you teaching it, it looks very nice. In the top left, that's our protein lysozyme. That's just one of the representations. On the right hand side, that's showing it with the secondary structures, the alpha helixes, the beta sheets, so you can really see what's there. The one on the bottom left right there, we just look at two specific amino acids, the lysines and the glycines, so you don't have to look at the entire protein, you can look at just those two pieces there. After that, we wanted to create, the wrong button, a dynamic structure of this protein to see how it moves, to see how this thing changes. So it took us about a day just to process this, just to put it into the computer. It then took us about two hours to process the animation, and this is what we got. So I, I skipped the previous slide, I must have said it twice. This gave us a video that was about a third of a second long after two hours, after a day of setting it up, something that was about a third of a second long. So this is why they really need the supercomputers because it took us two hours for something that took a third of a second and that's after we slowed it down. So the supercomputers allow you to map this a lot faster and this is why it's very important that they keep building these new supercomputers that are faster and faster to do more of this. This is a very basic protein. So as far as this research goes, there are several uh, different areas of study, but I know the, the largest conversations we had in our project was mostly about d drug discovery. So when we have these proteins in our body that are not working properly, they can find molecules that will fit into pockets of these malfunctioning proteins so that they will begin to work properly again. Also, uh, viruses, we can study the structure of viruses to create vaccines and things of that nature. Also, the enzymes that break down biofuels, so they will be able to be broken down more efficiently and uh, cleaner. So there are a lot of areas that can, can uh, be used from this research. Lastly, again, we would just like to thank AR U, or sorry, ARC, ORAU, and then Oak Ridge National Laboratory for having us be a part of these two weeks. Um, I have said it to a couple of people that had I known what existed when I was in high school, and as much as I love teaching, and I do love to teach, and I, I love to be with students, I'm not so sure I would have done what I did. I think I might have gone into something a little more, and somebody said to me, you know, it's not too late. So if you do really enjoy it or you have a passion for it, I encourage you strongly to just seek it. And if you feel like it's 
not going to happen. Just keep trying and trying and trying. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Glad you're here. Um, members of our group, we have Jamie Bartholomew from Pennsylvania. We have Kate Sarczewski from New York. We have over here Danielle Lee from West Virginia and myself, Jeremy Pease from Pennsylvania. So we're here to talk about investigating biomass structures um, dealing with biofuels. Our middle school group did a great job explaining biofuels, but I'm going to expand it a little bit more. So what exactly are biofuels? Biofuels are made out of biomass. Biomass is any plant structure or plant residue. Why are we using this? Because it's a natural carb hydrocarbon. Hydrocarbons are going to be your oils and your fuels. Well, if we can extract them from plants, they're renewable. We can grow them every year and make these processes. And it makes it a little bit more environmentally friendly. There are three types of biofuels. If you guys have pumped gas anytime lately, you're gonna see it says 10% ethanol. Well, that is usually made of corn. Now we are starting to use other plant structures also. And as the middle school did a great job, they made some biodiesel. You guys might have noticed this as you are driving around. If you get behind somebody's car and it's a diesel and you kind of smell french fries, it's probably running on leftover cooking oil. Okay, well, we can also mass produce vegetable oil and use it as biofuel also. There are advances coming out in biofuels, which is what we kind of looked at this last two weeks here at Oak Ridge. And those advances are looking at using algaes and also looking at using other parts of the plant. And that's what we're gonna to talk to you a little bit more about now. All right, so in our lab with Dr. Evans, um, we looked at organisms that can be used in the Advanced Biofuels program. We looked at four different organisms, winter rye, switchgrass, um, eucalyptus, and photosynthetic algae. So I have two pictures up here. One is of our winter rye, and that is a fast-growing annual plant that can grow in a variety of soils. And then next to it, we have switchgrass, which is also a fast-growing plant, but it's perennial, so it comes back every year and it's adapted to most climates. And you'll see that I put in tidbits about how they can grow in there because that's really important for talking about utilizing them as crops or as food sources. Okay, our next two are eucalyptus, and that is not native to the United States. As you might have guessed, you don't really see eucalyptus trees out there, um, but they have been found growing in California. And Dr. Evans is actually performing cutting edge research in her laboratory um, because not many people before have looked at using eucalyptus in a biofuels program. And last but not least is our photosynthetic algae, Glaucocystis. And this is very unique, not only because it's photosynthetic, but because it can grow in a variety of watery environments such as wastewater. So we can make use of different water environments um, and that'll also make it very interesting for research. Um, so why do we use these organisms? Plants and photosynthetic algae are a high rate renewable resource. They don't take very long to grow. We can chop them down, utilize them, and then within maybe a week, <laughs> have some plants starting to grow again. Whereas we know um, from earth science, our coals take a very long time to renew, if ever during our lifetime. Um, the plants can reduce CO2 emissions. They can be used as a feedstock for human and animals, so we can use them as food as well. And they usually require less in terms of soil quality and fertilizers, making them less expensive to grow and maintain. Okay. So as you see at this pie chart, there's a lot of different things that go into a plant. They're pretty neat little critters, okay? Traditionally, we've looked at hemicellulose and cellulose. These are both simple sugars that can break down fairly quickly. They can be fermented and this gives us our ethanol. Well, now we're starting to look at 
lignin. And this is what Dr. Evans is looking at in her lab. And the lignin is basically making up the cell wall. Make it simple. But it's hard to break down. It's a complex structure. So she's actually introducing um, deuterated water and deuterated glucose to these plants to make it easier to track. And Kate's going to tell us a little bit more about that. Okay, so in the lab, we grew a number of our organisms in a variety of conditions. We started off with our control in regular water. Next, we grew our plants in water plus glucose, gives them a little extra sugar, helps them to grow. Um, then we had water and deuterated glucose, so we added deuterium to the glucose molecule. And then next, we grew our plants in 50% D2O. So instead of being 100% water solution, it was 50% regular H2O plus 50% D2O. So then we tested the plants for carbon dioxide uptake, their light absorbance, and oxygen evolution. And that information tells us whether or not photosynthesis is still working. And if you want to look at our results, we actually showed that photosynthesis um, was in fact occurring in each of our specimens, and that information is on our poster. Um, but why do we use deuterium? Well, deuterium is a stable isotope of hydrogen, and it can be used in nuclear magnetic resonance imaging and neutron scattering, which, as you all know, we do a lot here at ORNL. Um, the deuterium has a lower signal than hydrogen. So when we're looking at results um, of images, we can see, we can tease out um, a better area of where the plant cell wall structures are. So it enhances imaging, and therefore we get a better understanding of the plant cell wall. From this information, we can then do further research to figure out how can we break down the plant cell wall and create biofuel from it. Lab fun, that's what we had. You got to learn about a whole different slew of tools. I do not come from the life sciences, so the life science tools were very new to me. Very uh, appreciative of Dr. Evans for letting us join her in her lab and go through such things. Uh, we got to use the, the hood. It's very important to keep everything sterile, kids, um, when you're doing lab experiments. We were able to uh, come in every morning and see how much our winter rye grass had grown. So it was really cool. It, it was kind of humorous to watch grown adults get excited at grass growing. <laughs> but it was very cool. It was useful for our data. And uh, we had a good time doing it. Uh, the cool part for me is I get to take some of this back to my class. Like I said, I don't do a lot with life sciences. Um, I teach future engineers. But there are engineers that have shown interest in becoming environmental engineers. There are a lot of environmental impacts um, due to the biofuels um, generation that's coming ahead. So uh, the environmental students will need to know how it affects the environment. And then we have the mechanical students for using things for fuels. They're going to be putting this in their engines that they're developing. So that's, that's pretty cool as well. Um, agricultural. Obviously, they got to grow the stuff, so they need to be educated in how to develop them faster, better, efficiently. Um, and then the petroleum engineers, as they're developing new fuels, um, these guys are going to be studying such things and be able to bring it to all of us in the world. Thank you. I'm going to focus on one subject that I teach, and that's chemistry. So this actually leans it, leads itself very nicely to chemistry. For those that teach chemistry, you know percent composition can be very boring to teach. But I kind of looked at this and was like, oh, well, we can take that equation, that reaction, and then look at the percent of carbon, look at the percent of hydrogen, look at the percent of oxygen in this process, and have the students calculate it this way. That way it's actually something they can apply. We can also talk about the environmental impacts. And then finally, a laboratory experiment. Now, a lot of us have done respiration in a bottle in biology class. You take your yeast, your water, and you make the balloon go up. Then you take yeast, water, and sugar, and then it blows up more. Well, 
we found an activity where we added actually a biofuel to it. We added grass to see how much it's going to break down. And we added cornmeal to see how much it's going to break down. So this is just an spin on what I actually originally thought everybody <laughs> knew about. Um, but we just added a little bit more to it that I could do in my chemistry class. So I'm from New York State, and I have the pleasure of teaching living environments and earth science. And this project with Bob, Dr. Barbara Evans was absolutely perfect for me. I can apply so much of it to my classroom. Um, just a number of topics. We can talk about renewable resources, um, rates of renewal, um, photosynthesis, plant cell wall structures, uh, biochemistry, the growing field of biotechnology, obviously the carbon cycle, and of course human impacts. I'm a librarian, so you may be wondering what I can use what we, the research for. Well, I can take it back to my classroom and teach research skills, not only with the books that we have, but also with our databases. I can also work with other teachers, including our science teachers, to come up with new STEM activities that they currently have not used. We can work interactive lessons and collaborative groups. Um, the library is going to be a facilitate, a area where I can facilitate different STEM activities throughout the school. Finally, we would like to thank all of ARC and Oak Ridge National Laboratories for giving us this opportunity. And we have some basic thank yous that we'd like to do for some individuals. For Jennifer and Pi, thank you guys for setting up this experience for us and our trips. Colt, thank you for being the best show forever. <laughs> Pat, Mary Sue, and Billy, thank you guys for your support. Jeff Schwartz and Eric Gold, thank you guys also for providing this opportunity. And finally, we would like to thank our mentor, Dr. Barbara Evans. Um, she was amazing, and she opened up her laboratory and gave us all, all a lot of her knowledge, and she has a lot, so thank you. <laughs> All right, before we get started, um, we want to take a moment and just introduce ourselves. My name is Sarah Johnson, and I am a chemistry and physics teacher from Kingston, Tennessee. I'm Ashley Gilliman. I teach chemistry and earth and space science at Valley High School in Valley, Alabama. My name is Annette Gillespie. I am a chemistry teacher from Southern Middle Tennessee. I am Stephanie Kimberlin. I live in Kentucky and teach in Claremont County, Ohio and I teach chemistry. All right, our process or our research um, involved generating novel lithium fluoride, europium doped calcium fluoride scintillators for neutron detection. I'm sure all of you know what that means. For the few that may not, um, I wanna first address what a scintillator is. Um, essentially, a scintillator is something that when it detects neutrons, it will fluoresce or glow brightly. And they have a variety of applications. Um, so specifically, we're looking at scintillators for use in the second target station at the Spallation Neutron Source at Oak Ridge. Um, they are also used commercially, in, especially in security. So in airports or on cell towers, scintillators can be used to detect if there is illegal transportation of nuclear material. And even if that material has been shielded for gamma radiation, Scintillators have the ability to discriminate between gamma radiation and neutrons, so they're especially useful even after those steps have been taken. What we specifically looked at is improving the light yield of the scintillators, so glow, making them glow brightly, as well as their ability to differentiate between the neutrons and the gamma radiation. And we did that by manipulating the ratio and the thickness of the two parts of our material. A scintillator, the scintillators we made were made of the first part, which is lithium-6 fluoride and europium-doped calcium fluoride, and then a second part, which was a polymer binder. And all that did was just hold it together and make it spread real nicely on the film. And so as you can see here, uh, we manipulated the ratios and as well as the thickness. I want to take a moment and address why we used lithium-6 fluoride and europium-doped calcium fluoride. When lithium-6 is hit with a neutron, 
it becomes lithium-7. That decays and forms two particles, one of which is an alpha particle, and the other is a tritium particle, which is just an isotope of hydrogen. And then we have europium-doped calcium fluoride. And all that means is some of the calcium atoms got replaced with europium atoms. And so when these particles from the lithium, the alpha particle and the tritium, excite electrons in the europium-doped calcium fluoride, it will grow a nice bright blue. So here's an example of what you might see from a scintillator that is currently used in um, commercial as well as research aspects. Here's an example of our samples fluorescing, and it doesn't look like they even come close to comparing, but we're going to be talking about some data that compare how well um, our samples fluoresce compared to current commercial samples. All right, I will be sharing with you some of the methods that we use to make the scintillators. Uh, first, the lithium-6 fluoride and the europium doped calcium fluoride had to be kept in the desiccator so that it kept all the moisture out. Uh, then as we took them out, we had to uh, measure them on the analytical balance very carefully but very quickly and return them back to the desiccator as soon as possible. Um, before we ground our sample, our mortar and pestle had been cleaned and dried in the oven. Um, but before we actually put our weighed out samples into the mortar and pestle, we also used the um, industrial hair dryer, uh, sorry, blow dryer to, uh, sorry, um, the industrial blow dryer to re remove any of the residual moisture that might have collected there. So once the mortar and pestle was cool, then we added our sample and we ground it into a very fine powder and mixed it thoroughly for 10 minutes. Uh, once the sample was ground, we placed that ground sample of the two materials into a pre-measured vial of the polymer binder and that was allowed to stir and mix on the automatic stir overnight. The following day, we came in and um, carefully cut aluminum foil strips into two and a half inch strips. Um, and we did it very carefully with a razor uh, to prevent any wrinkles or any tears that might cause problems as it was applied to the automatic film applicator. So we took the acetone and cleaned the glass of uh, the machine. Then we used acetone to adhere the aluminum to the glass. And then we also uh, added acetone to the top and wiped over with a chem wipe to remove any wrinkles or air bubbles that might cause problems in the sample. One of the things we were told from the start is we did not want that aluminum foil to wrinkle. And the big deal with that is the aluminum foil was only 20 micrometers thick, so a little bit thinner than what we generally use at home. It was very, very fragile. Once we got that aluminum foil firmly adhered to the glass surface of the automatic film applicator, then we were able to transfer our sample from that glass vial. We did that using a small pipette and we did it dropwise so that we formed a very small puddle on top of the aluminum foil. Once we had our puddle, then we could put a slot head die um, adjusted either 175 uh, micrometers or 250 micrometers depending on the thickness that we needed. And then it was just a matter of pressing a button and having it spread the sample across the aluminum foil. After we had our samples spread across the aluminum foil, we placed them in an oven. We baked them for 176, at 176 degrees Fahrenheit for approximately two hours. Then we increased the temperature to 230 degrees Fahrenheit overnight and allowed it to bake overnight. When we returned the next morning, we had uh, formed samples. That bottom picture that you see here 
is a fresh out of the oven, ready to go sample. However, they can't process the samples that come out of the oven. We actually had to have one inch diameter circular samples in order for SNS to be able to um, test their fluorescing power. So we used a stamp and die kit to very, very, very carefully uh, cut out a piece um, within our sample that we had prepared. And you can see I'm standing there with a mallet. Um, we actually had to hit the stamp with a mallet to make sure that the cut was perfect because again, the main thing we were trying to avoid is a tear in that sample or a wrinkling or tearing of that aluminum foil. It was also difficult to get it out of the dye because again, we're trying desperately not to tear the sample, not to wrinkle the aluminum foil. So we essentially had to tease it out with plastic forceps. And once we got it out with the plastic forceps, then we could gently place it in a labeled sample bag. And ultimately we were able to submit three scintillator samples to SNS for processing. So imagine we've just taken you on a journey of baking cookies. And the best part of cookie baking is, how do they taste? So we're not going to taste our scintillators, but we do have some results. If you would look at the graph on your right, um, please focus on the area circled in red. That area indicates that a scintillator produced prior, prior to us coming here in the lab with our recipe of lithium-6 fluoride and europium-doped calcium fluoride, that area in the red with the black line indicates that samples produced by this lab fluoresce 2.3 times brighter than the current commercial samples when tested. Um, on the left is some raw data for the samples that we got to submit to the SNS facility here at Oak Ridge. And the area in the red circle is comparable. We didn't have a lot of time to process the data, but it works really well. And it's very exciting because the current scintillating materials in use, um, helium-3 isotope, there's a big shortage. So there's a real push to get better materials quicker so we don't have this helium problem. Future research for this is really in perfecting the technique and turning the films that you saw on the aluminum foil, trying to get them to be more clear um, the clarity improves the neutron detection. So that's where the lab's going. The recipe's there, it's in the details. The devil's in the details. It was an amazing time to work with such amazing people. Um, Dr. Pran's Pranthama is so distinguished. It's, it was an honor for all of us. I mean, he's like the scientist that we all talk about in our classrooms. You know, that scientist, well, he's it. Um, also, our facilitator is so experienced, he really held our hand and helped us through this. And it would be a terrible um, thing if we didn't mention Ryan Veach, who was the intern in the lab. And although he is a very young man, uh, we were his minions. <laughs> he was the one, don't rip it, it's my last sample. Um, we had a great time here. What we learned about isotopes is so applicable in our classrooms because when we talk about isotopes in chemistry, it's a very abstract idea. And students are like, well, why do I care? And we're like, medicine? So you gotta get sick, you know, to, to, to learn the knowledge. But when we were here, we were like, oh my gosh, lithium-6 and it's used in this. It's also used in dosimeters that half the campus walks around with. So the learning really how these abstract things can be used is going to be very helpful in our classroom when getting our kids interested. Um, thank you so much for having us. It is a great honor to be here. It instilled in us a huge national pride. Oak Ridge is amazing. And it instilled in us a true pride in being Appalachian. So thank you. This is our final group of teachers that we have here today, and this group of teachers worked at the ORAU, Cytogenic Biodosimetry Laboratory. Four girls, one guy thrown together for two weeks in July. You 
united by a common goal and a lot for students that warms the soul. A scientific question at hand that could only be part of a grander plan. Students are the leaders of tomorrow and we can inspire them with our gusto. Or chromosomes, centrifuges, pipettes and blood, finding neutrophils and lymphocytes in the Oak Ridge Hood. Thanks to Earl Gold, Jeff Schwartz, or a you and Jen Tyrell. Our resident teachers, mentors in ORNL. A special thanks for our states and ARC. We hope we make you proud, Maria and Bala G. I'm Julia Sello. I'm from. I teach. I teach biology in Camp Bell Savona Junior Senior High School in Camp Bell, New York. I'm Amy Rott. I teach the science needs of our students at Bridgeport Academy in Port Allegheny, Pennsylvania. I'm Leah Carmichael. I teach middle school science and math, biology and anatomy at Cornerstone Christian School in Columbiana, Alabama. Good morning, I'm Chris Hudson, M Mount View High School, Welch, West Virginia. I teach band and choir. <laughs> Hi, I'm Laura Banks. I'm from Stamford, New York, where I teach biology, chemistry, and seventh grade life science. Our project was looking at estimating radiation exposure using chromosomal aberration in human lymphocytes. Our mentors were Dr. Bailaji and Maria Escalona. <laughs> so in the lab these last couple of weeks, we looked at ionizing radiation. We all experience ionizing radiation in our everyday lives, whether it be our granite countertops, radon seepage in basements, x-rays when we go to the doctor or the dentist, as well as mining for materials is a big um, source of ionizing radiation. Turns out we learned that DNA is very susceptible to double strand breaks whenever we encounter ionizing radiation, but it's very, very dependent on dosage. So we call that word biodosimetry. It's just a big word that means the biological effects of radiation. This lab um, exercise and this lab existence is very important in the case of nuclear catastrophe, which is the primary reason that this lab exists. Um, it's very, very important that we measure the amount of absorption. So for you high school students, you wore a dosimeter this week that measured the amount of radiation that you were encountering in the environment. However, that doesn't tell you how much absorption your body actually took. So in order to measure that, we must look at internal something. And that internal something was lymphocytes. So that's actually what we looked at in the lab this week. Lymphocytes are a type of bl white blood cell. White blood cells are very important in our body's immunity. They are very easy to acquire. The pictures here, you see four of our teachers, most of us grinning like idiots, getting our blood drawn, which you might think, why in the world would you be so happy to get your blood drawn? Well, the first day that we were there, Dr. Biology says to us, hey, would you like to look at your DNA? Well, what do you think four nerdy science teachers said? Yeah. So he says, okay, we need to draw blood. Well, I don't know about anybody else, but my level of excitement went down just a little bit. But then, as I started thinking about it, I'm like, DNA, blood drawn? Yeah. Who, who wouldn't go for that, right? So... He took our blood, we um, worked in the lab to isolate the lymphocytes. Turns out that lymphocytes are a very good way to assess the um, radiation that a person has absorbed because they're very radiosensitive. So Laura's gonna tell you a little bit more about the radiosensitivity of lymphocytes. So when lymphocytes are hit by radiation, they do undergo double-stranded breaks. As these breaks are repaired, sometimes they're repaired inaccurately. So we have two chromosomes, as you can see in our picture up here. The radiation is a little lightning bolt. They break the two with a centromere, which is the red dot. It holds the two uh, chromatids together. They fuse together. So now instead of having one chromosome with one centromere, we have a larger chromosome with two centromeres. So we pretty much, in essence, fuse two different chromosomes together. We also have the creation of acentric fragments. The pieces that don't have centromeres also fuse together. Well, why this is important is we only see them in radiation. So it's a mutation specific to radiation exposure. And it's also really good because it doesn't happen on its own. In baseline data, you only get about one per 1,000 cells. 
So you can easily see an increase from radiation exposure. So it is considered the gold standard for biodissymmetry. It has been around since the 60s. It is quite sensitive for um, exposure from 0.2 to 5 grays. Grays is the unit that we use to say how much radiation you absorbed. This is important because at these levels, you don't always get physical symptoms. You don't get vomiting and other things like that. So it tells us more how well you are exposed and what can we do to help you. And it's also reproducible. You can give the same sample to multiple labs and have them come back with the same dosage. So the picture here actually shows what we looked at. So you can see the regular chromosomes where it's pinched in and lighter pink would be our centromere. So the one in the middle has two centromeres, making a dicentric. The process to, com to collect lymphocytes, although long, is relatively easy. Whole blood is collected, which we all graciously donated, and cultured with a growth medium to encourage mitosis. After incubating for 24 to 48 hours, clostamid is added to stop cell division at metaphase. A series of repetitive steps is then completed to isolate the white blood cells. They're then placed in a salt solution to lyse the cells and spread the chromosomes. After being placed on slides, a microscope called a metaphor was used to locate and image the metaphase cells. After the metaphor, metaphor was completed, evaluators begin the task of looking for the dicentric chromosomes. The evaluators will need to analyze a minimum of 500 metaphase cells. The current slide shows four dicentric chromosomes. Each will need to be counted. <clears throat> The purpose of counting those dicentric chromosomes is so that we can figure out the actual dosage that a person has been exposed to and absorbed. Um, each lab that does this process makes what's called a calibration curve, as you can see here. They, they count how many dicentric chromosomes there are in certain metaphase spreads. Um, and then for known samples that have been exposed to known, known amounts of radiation. They then plot this and get a nice curve, as you see on the, on the screen. Um, then to, what we did is we counted chromoso dicentric chromosomes in a large sample. And for example, if there were 300 dicentric chromosomes, which is a lot, in a sample of 500, you would get, divide those numbers to get the aberrations per cell. So if in that case, the math would be 0.6 aberrations per cell. When you go to the calibration curve, that's um, determines that the dosage is 2.5 gray, which is pretty high. But knowing that number, you could figure out what that person needs to, to do and how they need to be treated to deal with that dosage. So the question becomes, with the case of a mass casualty event, um, a large nuclear catastrophe, that's a lot of chromosomes to count. So there aren't enough people who are professionally trained to do this so we wanted to know, can people with minimal training accurately complete dosimetry? Can we make accurate dosi dosage estimations? With our very large sample of five people, um, we counted 102 chromosome spreads and determined that the dicentrics, we identified between 57 and 63 dicentric chromosomes. Um, and the dosages all fell within the error rate of 95% confidence level. So even untrained, like we were trained for a day, half a day, and we came up with an, a pretty accurate count of dicentric molecules and an accurate dosage. Um, they were within 0.1 or 0.2 gray, which doesn't make the treatment to, to, for that person that much different. To date, I am the first band guy. I must have a few notes. <laughs> this is of great significance. Um, in our world today, we are uh, facing increased nuclear presence um, and also increased risk of a nuclear catastrophe. Uh, there's a need to have more people trained uh, to estimate dosage of radiation. This allows for faster counting 
and dosage estimation to get people triaged as necessary. One way to normalize dicentric counts is to use fluorescence in situ hybridization, which uses fluorescent probes to bind to particular sections of chromosomes. Using the metaphor microscope, the metaphase spreads are imaged with a fluorescent filter and the telomeres seen here in red and centromeres seen in green are clearly different colors than the chromosome in blue. This process, process makes it much easier to identify centromeres, which reduces the amount of error in counting dicentrics. Two green sparks equals one dicentric chromosome. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. We had a wonderful time, and we hope to return soon. We are the uh, Prototype Material Plasma Exposure Experiment, or Proto-MPEX group. I'm Daisy Sawyer from Asheville, North Carolina. I'm Jennifer Salazar-Sanchez from West Jefferson, North Carolina. I'm Garrett Nunley from Tazewell, Virginia. I'm Alex Music from Welch, West Virginia. I'm Jared Clem from uh, Cumberland, Maryland. And I'm Caleb Cantrell from Mill Spring, North Carolina. So what is plasma? Plasma is the fourth state of matter. You got solid, liquid, gas, and then your plasma. It is the most common state of matter in the universe. Some examples of plasma are these fluorescent lights you have above your head, fire, and electrical arcs, and probably the best example of plasma is our sun. So plasma and fusion. Fusion occurs when two atoms are merged together. Our sun is a great example of a giant fusion reactor. It runs off of a deuterium and tritium reaction as seen in the presentation above. When the two atoms combine, they throw off a neutron particle and leave behind a helium atom. So, plasma and fusion can only be reached at very high temperatures. Uh, temperatures on Earth can, for example, like water boils at approximately 100 degrees Celsius, and it takes up to 1 million degrees Celsius here on Earth. So, as you can imagine, it's very hard to achieve. Um, the heat that, is, that can be made from fusion, though, is very cost effective. Um, about one gram of material, about the amount of mass in this index card, can create enough energy when fused together, more than 400,000 barrels of oil. So fusion is definitely going to be in our future for energy. Capital Q. What capital Q is, it's a value that scientists who work with fusion have come up with to um, compare the amount of energy that is put out by the fusion machine, sometimes called a tokamak, which is a certain kind of model, to the energy put in. Some energy that is put in that has to be overcome can be the energy that is used to cool the magnets uh, that contain the plasma um, as the energy that the magnets create when they vibrate needs to be cooled off so, the, so that the tokamak doesn't overheat and also simply the gas that's put in. Um, to date, no tokamak has achieved a Q value of 0.1, which is the goal, which is the break even. Um, but there are very certainly many projects that have come close to this goal. One of the most famous nuclear fusion reactors that has ever been built is the Joint European Taurus. It's located in Oxford, England. And it is about three stories tall and has gotten a Q value of 0.7, which is almost break even, but not quite. ITER is currently being built in Aix-en-Provence, France, and it is uh, expected to be finished in 2022 and will be running plasma by about 2028. It's hopeful that they'll get a Q value of at least one, but they're really expecting it to get a lot higher, a Q value of maybe five to ten. All right. So for the purpose of our experiment, we use the proto Impex, which is a machine that's designed to test the effect on plasma on certain materials. So... The proto impacts no fusion actually happens within the machine, but in, instead it simulates the sort of environment that would happen in a fusion reactor. You can see right about there is where our probe was inserted for the purposes of our experiment, or right there in the photograph. So this is the type of probe we use. It's called a ball probe. It's made up of a metal spear, a thermocouple, and a vacuum device to attach the probe to the machine. This is a fully assembled probe with the readout screen for the thermocouple. So we made a sort of diagnostic model to better understand what was going on in the proto-impacts. So to compare to, we 
we shot a dark gun at the probe to compare to the force of the plasma on the probe, and then we used a heat gun to compare to the force, uh, the heat of the plasma on the probe. So once we were done with our model, we used a similar concept into the proto impacts. So in the first video that you will see right here, that is the plasma, which is, tends to be a bright pink, but it depends on the material, the atom that you use. So once we were done, can you find the second? we captured another video with a black and white camera, and we measured how the plasma would affect our ball probe, which represented the force and the heat. So I hope you all understand exactly what we did. <clears throat> we just developed this uh, small scale model. This uh, hair dryer represents the proto impex itself. All these streamers represent the plasma, and this pen will be our probe. Now what we did was we attached it to the outside of the machine and slowly inserted it till it was about three centimeters away from the machine and measured what was on the outside, the force and the heat and so on, and slowly inserted it until it was in the middle. And then all the way through until it was three centimeters past and brought it all the way back out. Okay. So once we were done with our model, we calculated the temperature. We tested three different spheres, steel, brass, and aluminum. We measured our temperature reaction in 10 minutes. And at the five minute interval, we switched the heat gun from heating to cooling. The, la the two graphs down on the bottom are the delta temperature and the heat flux, which were from the proto impex. Um, we noticed that our ball probe um, tended to have a greater temperature around when we were moving the radial down or up, and when it was in the center, it tended not to have so much temperature. So once we got the delta temperature, we calculated the heat flux. All right, so right here is a, oh, how do I use this? Um, so right here, oh, okay, is a graph of the <laughs> Uh, high density versus the low density plasma. The high density is the blue line and the low density is the red line. As you can see um, for both the heat flux and the uh, delta temperature, at, when the radius is zero, the high density plasma peaks and for the low density, when the radius is towards the edges, negative three and positive three, it's peaking at those points as well. All right, so another thing that we had to find was the spring constant of our probe in order to calculate the force that the plasma exerted on the probe. To do so, we use the equation right there, uh, where our constant is equal to the mass of the ball, the sphere right there, times the force of gravity divided by the distance that our probe was weighed down. We found our distance that our probe was weighed down by using a hook that we just placed on it and measured that. Okay, so what does this all mean? So when we did our experiment, we were looking for two things, the heat flux of the plasma on the probe and the force the plasma exerted on the probe. We found that the heat flux was greatest when the radius was zero with high density plasma, and that was overall what was the greatest heat flux, but for the low density plasma, it was greatest um, on the edges of the cylinder, so like negative three and positive three. Um, as for the force, we found that the force exerted was very minute. Uh, it was about 0.34 newtons which is small, but that's probably because it was on the dump end of the machine rather than the target end where the plasma is meant to go. <laughs> so just to put this into perspective, um, one 115th times the force of a Nerf gun is equal to the force of the plasma, which is very small. <laughs> and we found that 1.1 million times the force of a heat gun is equal to the plasma heat, which is very large. So. Okay, so we would like to give a special thanks to our mentor, Dr. Theodore Buer. Thank you so much for allowing us to be part of the, your research that you have been conducting in the lab. Um, and in this assistance, Missy Showers, Holly Ray, Gwen Shaw, Josh Beers, Christian Skeen, and Daniel Martin for helping us these two last weeks with our project. And in the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, the Oak Ridge Associate Universities, and Jennifer Tyrell for donating their time and helping us do this. And then our resident teachers, Billy Limble, Dr. Kelly, Pat, Fitzpatrick, and Cole for guiding us these last two weeks and keeping up with us. <laughs> and then and then the Appalachian Regional Commission, Jeff Schwartz and Argo, who helped fund our projects. Thank you. I'm Chaz Weeks. I'm from Nelsonville, Ohio, and I'm 
I'm Alaric Scott. I'm a senior and I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee. I'm Christian York and I'm a junior from Coleman, Alabama. I'm Rob Perry and I'm a senior from Williamsburg, Kentucky. I'm Nicole Moore. I'm a junior from Ridgeway, Pennsylvania. I'm Winter Sparrison. I'm a senior from Schoharie, New York. <laughs> I'm Andrea Jordan. I'm a junior from Coosa County, Alabama. We're representatives from Atlas R Computer, and our goal was to build a supercomputer and figure out which year it actually would have been the fastest. Uh-oh. Okay. So what is a supercomputer? A supercomputer is a powerful mainframe computer. It has higher level computational capacity, and it aims to enhance speed and memory. So why do we use supercomputers and why are they helpful? Well, they're helpful because they have immediate communication, faster calculations, nationwide defense like nuclear weapons or bombs. They allow people around the world to play online games and even the news uses them to predict the weather. So even though we are from the supercomputer team, half of us didn't even wouldn't be able to confidently tell you what the difference between hardware and software when we first arrived here, which is kind of sad, but we learned it right away. So what our facilitator, Jerry Sherrod, taught us was that hardware is anything that's magnetic, um, mechanical, or electronic. It was basically all components of the computer, such as the computer itself, the mouse, the keyboard, anything you can feel, see, touch, hold in your hands. So the way he taught it to us was anything that could hurt you if it was to fall on you is basically hardware. For instance, this monitor behind us, if it was to fall on us, that, that's hardware, it would hurt us. Um, in contrast, software is just a program that you install onto the hardware. It relies heavily on the hardware itself. Software, it couldn't hurt you even if it was to fall off the Eiffel Tower. So, steer clear of hardware. Oh, oops. So some of the software we needed in order for our supercomputer to work efficiently was PuTTY, CentOS, and Anger IP Scanner. We also experimented with um, MVWare and Wireshark after our exp experiment was over just to enhance our knowledge on supercomputing. Binary numbers. Binary, most computers have binary numbers, especially supercomputers. They have, they're mostly based off of place values and they have two different, um, they have two different symbols, ones and zeros. So what is one plus one? Two. Well, most people would say two, but in binary numbers, the answer is one zero. So here's another one for you. What's one zero, one zero, one zero? Well, it's 42. And here I'm gonna explain how we get that. So as you see up here, in the one's place, there's a zero, so you wouldn't add anything. In the two's place, there's a one, so you would add a two. In the four's place, there's a zero. In the eight's place, there's a one, so you would add eight. In the 16th place, there's a zero. In the 32th place, there's a one, so you'd add 32. So after you add them all together, you get 42 as your decimal. Now, if you understand binary numbers now, you'd get this little slogan we have behind us, and I put a chart beside so you can, so it'll help you. So it says, binary is as easy as one, two, three. All right, now it's time for the most important part of anything that we did. It was the ethernet cables. The ether without the ethernet cables, the computer wouldn't even work. So they're a very big hill for us. So at first, we had an Ethernet cable. It was just a regular cable at first. Then we got some wire cutters. We cut it, and then we unsheathed it, and it had a bunch of wires inside, like on the picture behind me. Well, we didn't really have to do much. We just had to put the wires that were in it in a specific order, and when we did that, they would work. If it wasn't in that specific order, though, it wouldn't work at all. So we had to be very careful when we did this. Then once we had it in the Pacific order, we put the RJ45 plug on it, and that would allow us to actually connect it into walls and other things. Then the Ethernet cable, now we can, that we have one, we can use it for multiple things. So it allows you to connect straight to the Internet. So let's say your whole family's there, and they're using up all the Wi-Fi. Well, you don't, can't really connect now. So what you do is plug in the Ethernet cable to your device and then plug the other into the wall and you'll be able to connect straight to the Internet, which would be really helpful. Another thing is that since this is a direct connection to the Internet, it makes it really hard for people to hack your hardware, which is really helpful. 
It also, <laughs> it also allows you to have a closed network with all the other people on your network group, which allows you to send stuff from one computer to the other really, really fast. Oh, okay, so networking. Um, networking is just a fancy word for sharing information, you know, communicating. And just a quick show of hands, who here uses Facebook? Instagram? MySpace? Ha. Huh. I'm old, sorry about that. But <laughs> we use networking, it's not just for computers, it's now there's also human networking. Networking is just talking to people, sharing information, and connecting. In computers, how we use networking is it's used in social media. When you watch YouTube or Netflix, that's networking. When we call our parents or we talk to our friends on the phone, that's another form of networking. Playing video games online, and when you go to work and you send that report or portfolio to your boss, that's networking. Now, there are three types of networking or three basic types. Unicasting, multicasting, and broadcasting. And my friend Chaz here is gonna show us exactly what those three are. Unicasting is when one computer sends data to one specific computer. Then multicast is where one computer sends data to multiple specific computers. Then a broadcast is where one computer sends data to all the other computers. Thank you, Chess. Uh, all right, a Beowulf cluster. That's just a fancy name for the supercomputer we built. A uh, Beowulf cluster is a smaller computers clustered together to make a bigger, more powerful computer. And then it has other computers on the outside of it communicating with this computer. So it's networking at its core. Okay, so China's T 2 is currently the world's fastest supercomputer, performing at an amazing rate of 93 petaflops. Or no, it's Titan used to be the world's fastest supercomputer, until it was surpassed by uh, China's T-82. But as of late, Owarno has been constructing a new supercomputer that will run faster than China's T-82 and will probably be completed by the year 2018. Now, China's T-82 is 505.37% faster than our supercomputer that we built. But since it's our first time doing something like this and building a supercomputer at all, we were able to reach a, a pretty good speed of 40, about 47 gigaflops. So like my fellow partner, Andrea, mentioned earlier, we were tasked with the question, when will your supercomputer be the fastest in the world? Through the use of HPL, or High Performance Lin Pack, other programs like PuTTY, and our extensive research, we were able to determine that our supercomputer would be the fastest in the year 1992. We would like to thank our mentor, Robert Witten, our facilitator, Papa Jerry, and Tammy, Jake, and Nick. Also, we'd like to thank ORNO, ARC, and ORAU for giving us this opportunity. Also, I was supposed to ask you guys if you guys want to buy an Ethernet cable for 500 grand. <laughs> Anyone? Nope. Okay. Sorry, no. Okay. Hello, I'm Larry Herman. I come from Wilkesboro, North Carolina, and I go to West Wilkes High School, and I am going to be a rising senior. I'm Derek Hutchinson. I'm from Tazewell, Virginia. I go to Tazewell County High School, and I'm going to be a junior this coming year. I am Christian Sharp from Whitley County High School in Kentucky, and I'm a rising junior. 
I am Austin Zillman from Coleman, Alabama. I'm going to be a rising junior. And we are the visualization group. We found a problem with um, emergency workers and civil engineers needing to know where populous, populations are in a quick and orderly fashion. The, and the way they would do it normally is they would look through data sheets and it would take an enormous amount of time and it would be really flawed with errors. The way we figured out how to do it in an easier and quicker way was to put the data in a visual form so they could get the information quickly and effectively. And Derek is going to tell us how we did it. Thank you. As you can see, coming with R can be very simple. But as time goes on, it gets more and more complicated and honestly pretty cooler. But as it gets more and more complicated, the need for debugging arises more and more. Debugging, it was a major part of what we did through these past few weeks. And it's annoying at first, I'll admit. But once you get used to it, it gets pretty fun trying to figure out exactly where the codes failed and fix it. Plus, after all the bugs are ironed out, you get, in, you get a reusable app that everyone can use, or anyone. And to be perfectly honest, it beats, an app really beats having to search through a spreadsheet to find any, all the data that you need. And if I remember right, I believe my friend Christian here has a live demo of our app, Patty. If you would like to take it away, Christian. So as the previous group said, they were the hardware part of all computers and such. We did the software. So this is Patty, projecting accessible demographics for inside extraction. This site is fi finally fully operational after two weeks of work. On screen right now is the entire United States color coded for total population. As you can see, the more populated, more dense uh, numbers of people are highlighted in dark blue. As you can see, California, Texas, Florida, the northern states. On this tab, we have a more in-depth look at information in a specific area. It becomes more precise as you go down from states to county. Before we started, I asked a representative from my state of Kentucky, Eric Cornell, which you just saw earlier with the middle school uh, Kentucky students, um, to give me a state and county. So instead of giving us Kentucky like I expected, he told us to go all the way down to Ohio and Franklin County, which is just easier to just type it in. So right now we're looking at the entire state of Ohio, but when I switch it to the county, it pulls up the Franklin County. Now, unlike the previous full United States, the more populated areas are in the, ver the most pale colors. So in the center of this county, you have the highly populated, or the least populated areas, and on the borders is m more populated. Now, this is especially important if you are, say, like an emergency worker, a rescue worker, and something happens in the more populated areas, and you need to, um, get them out into a more spacious area that has a lot less threats and less people so you can kind of make sure everyone's there. Now, we also have a final tab which uses machine learning to compare and group information that it gets so I can actually make it have different comparisons. Now, we will go on to Austin Selman to wrap us up for the presentation. All right, as previously stated, Patty is used to get information quicker and more, it's more efficient and quicker than your normal means like books or scrolling through a page of information. And it shows population density and ethnicity and in certain areas, all sorts of things depending on what information we are given. If, per se, like was previously stated again, 
a rescue worker or city engineers need this information, they just look at the app and they would be able to tell where most people live or if anybody even lives there so they can build more onto it. Um, Patty also cuts down hours of work. It's so much faster than actually looking through books and websites and all this. Like you can just load the app and you could find what you need in a quick, fast, quick and fast, quick and efficient way. And as more information is given, it can be updated throughout the years. We can have more and more information added to Patty to make Patty better. Make her, make her faster, make her better. And at first, I believe most of us were nervous, had no idea what we were going into. There was two of us that had any coding ability at all. I myself had none. I was a drafter. I could not do anything like that. So I learned and I thought it was, I didn't like it too much at first, but then as I got into it, I thought it was a very fun experience. And I thought, people should really learn this more. All right. And I would like, and to wrap this up, I would like to say thank you to Earl Gull and Jeff Schwartz for funding and all for funding this and allowing us to come. Dr. Lunga, our teacher, who really helped us learn all of this. And all the state representatives, all the tutors, I really want to thank all of you for allowing us to come here and be able to learn. This is an opportunity that not many people, use, not many people get. So I am very happy and I'm sure most of our team is too. So thank you. This group worked with the Materials Science and Technologies Division. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lexi Paxton and I attend Rockbridge County High School in Lexington, Virginia. Hi, my name is Jade Noah. I live in Tazewell, Tennessee and I go to Claiborne High School. Hi, I'm Patrick Lawson. I'm from Richlands, Virginia, and I go to Richlands High School. Hi, my name is Cole Brewer. I'm from Richmond, Kentucky, and I go to Model Laboratory High School. Our group is the Magnetic Levitation Group, and we worked with uh, superconductors and uh, their interactions with uh, magnetic fields. In our experiment, we used uh, flux pinning to levitate a superconductor above a magnetic track. This image here, or animation, is a frog being uh, levitated in a magnetic chamber. Frogs are naturally diamagnetic, which is a type of magnetism that Lexi will explain here. So in order to understand why the superconductor levitated, we looked into the four different types of magnets. The first type are ferromagnets, and those are spontaneously aligning permanent magnets. And we usually think of those as like common household magnets that you would put on a fridge. And antiferromagnets are the complete opposite, and they act as non-magnets. Um, some current uses are, well, futuristic uses uh, include like um, electronics and stuff like that. So paramagnets are um, disordered Magnets that when presented with a magnetic field align as in the as the picture shows So in absence of a magnetic field, they're random and when the magnetic field is present they align and lastly Diamagnets those are the super superconductors uh, They are the complete opposite of paramagnets So instead of attracting the force they repel it and make the superconductors levitate
So superconductors are metals that, when cooled to a specific temperature, lose all electrical resistance. This means that if you pass an electric current through them, they do not lose any energy uh, from the, sorry, the electrical current does not lose any energy. So normal conductors, such as copper, can uh, remove up to 30% of the energy from an electric current. But if you pass it through a superconductor, it comes out the other end just as strong. When a metal becomes superconducting, it becomes a perfect diamagnet, and it in fact completely expels all magnetic fields from inside of itself. This is referred to as the Meissner effect. Uh, however, some superconductors have little imperfections inside of them that pin magnetic field lines inside of them, which locks the superconductor into the magnetic field. This allows you to levitate a superconductor along a track. But if the magnetic field is too strong, it can force the metal out of its superconducting state. OK, for our experiment, we use superconductors of different sizes, one weighing in at 1.53 grams and the other weighing in at 6.32 grams. We studied the effects that gravity, weight, and magnetic resistance has against the superconductor. Uh, we tested the samples for different effects, such as which one would levitate for longer and which one levitates higher. So to do this, we use liquid nitrogen to lower the metal's temperature in order for the material to be a superconductor. Uh, liquid nitrogen has a temperature of 77 Kelvin, which is negative 300, excuse me, negative 320 degrees in Fahrenheit. So we have a chart here to show just how drastic that difference is. Body temperature is 310 Kelvin, liquid nitrogen 77. Forgot to point. So we have a demonstration here of our assistant Tony uh, showing how exactly we tested these. I think that was the wrong button. So these superconductors, when cooled, go from a state of resting upon the superconductor, and when you supercool them to a certain degree, or certain temperature rather, they levitate above the superconductor. So with type 1 superconductors, levitate from the magnet, sorry. With type 1 superconductors, there's either it's on or it's off. There's no in-between gray area. But with type 2, which is what we used, there's a little bit of gray space where there's slight superconductivity which is why it slowly stopped moving instead of just abruptly halting when it warmed back up. Um, you guys saw the video and you saw that it moved quickly, quickly, but as it heated up, it started to slow down and stop. We practiced different materials to see which one would hold it and keep it colder for longer. We found that when you put liquid nitrogen and a conductor in aluminum, it held it colder longer. We found that the smaller superconductor that we used levitated much higher, but it heated up quicker than the larger one, and that's because its mass was smaller. We use the um, thermal energy equation to find this out. C is your specific heat constant, which is around two. M is your mass, it's the one that changes in each equation, and then Delta T was your temperature from when it was a superconductor to when it finally heated up and it just became a magnet again. Uh, the smaller superconductor had a thermal energy at around 40, and the larger one had a thermal energy rate about 104. So it took more energy to heat up the larger one. So how could superconductors impact the future? So, as Cole mentioned earlier, when an electrical current is passed through a normal conductor, it loses up to 30% of its energy. If we had a superconductor that could work at room temperature, we could pass electrical currents from power plants through power lines without losing any energy, period, due to resistance. We could also use trains, which right here is a concept picture of a maglev train. We could use them without having to waste resources, such as biofuels. It would be basically a unnecessarily renewable method of transportation. However, she clicked too soon, sorry. There are no known superconductors that work at room temperature at this time, which is another aspect of research we still need to look into. So 
we would like to send uh, a huge thanks to Jeff Schwartz, Earl Goal, uh, Peggy Satterley from Kentucky, Brooke, Brooksy Carlton from Tennessee, and Tamara Holmes from Virginia, along with the Oak Ridge National Laboratory for allowing us to spend two weeks at a wonderful place. We would also like to thank Jennifer Tyrell and Pi Moa for, <laughs> sorry, I'm bad at pronouncing things, for basically organizing this and leading us through an amazing op opportunity. We would like to thank Dr. Mary Sue Kelly, Patricia Fitzpatrick, Han Yong Lee, Tony Wong, Billy Linville, Colt Naramore, and John Nichols for teaching us both in the lab and outside the lab, and helping us prepare for our future careers. Okay, hello, I am Gavin Nelson uh, from Pennsylvania. My name is Andrew Morgan, I'm 16 years old and I'm from Alabama. I'm Jarrett Bostick and I'm from Richland, Virginia. Uh, Joseph Palmatier, I'm from Delavan, New York. Hello, my name is Brian Epperson. I'm from Whitesburg, Kentucky. I'm Elijah Lawson, and I'm from Merville, Tennessee. And I'm Tanner Balin, I'm from Wilkesboro, North Carolina. So we're going to talk about robotics for a little bit. All right, so the main two concepts we learned were robotics and coding. And the difference between the two is robotics is the hardware, and then the coding is the software, as two of our earlier groups mentioned before. And robotics, the whole industry is used for the purpose of automation. In other words, making it to where humans don't have to work and only the robots have to. And the main two purposes for automation is for safety and for efficiency. Robots can normally do it faster and a lot safer. And then the coding that we learned is what programmers put into the robot. We put in the instructions in robot language instead of human language, and then thus the robot completes the task we tell it to. So you ask, what is our research? Well, our research is to use three different types of sensors that the robot has to move by. The first one is our control, which is just directly giving it like a one-way feedback to the robot. Our second sensor is IR, and our third sensor would be whiskers. And if you look at the picture, this is our mechanism we use to test it as a gate. And so as motion enters through the gate at the start, it will start the time. And as soon as the robot or any form of motion enters the end gate, time will stop. So in general, our actual research hypothesis, hypothesis was that using an infrared sensor, we would, be, we would be able to more accurately go through the path at hand and use as little lines of code as possible. The reason we believe that was because, in general, infrared sensors constantly sweep the environment surrounding it and have, in general, more sensory input, allowing for a more precise movement. And in regards to the least lines of code aspect, in general, the infrared sensor is pretty heavily built into the uh, PBASIC platform, which we programmed our robot on. All right. Um, in comparison to the other sensors, Brian and I's project was with whiskers. IR sensors are meant to sweep and see the obstacles. Ours uses those two whiskers, is what we call them, I don't know what else they are, with the arrows. Those send back binary code, ones and zeros, in this case zeros, when it bumps into something. If it hits it on the left side, it will back up, turn the other way, and continue on. Elijah and I both uh, worked on the infrared bot and uh, the infrared sensor detects infrared radiation that comes off the objects so whenever the right sensor detected infrared radiation it would turn left and the left if it detected infrared radiation it would turn right and if they both detected it would back up and turn the fastest way out. Tanner and I were part of the programming team. And so what we were, we were the control group. So if we wanted to turn left, we had to forcefully program it to turn left. If we wanted to, if we wanted to go forward, we had to tell it to go forward and how far forward to actually go. And so if we wanted to back up, we had to manually put in 
when to back up, how far to back up, and when to turn. I was the photographer. Uh, on top of learning about all the robots, I mainly took pictures, except, except that one. That, that would have been a little hard to take. I also edited a video you guys will see in a couple minutes. And, yeah. So who won? Well, if you ask yourself who did it, who completed the course in the shortest amount of time and who had the least lines of code, well, then it would be the IR sensors. But if you ask yourself who was more consistent in results, well, it was the pre-programmed robot. But if you want to say, if we want to put in an instant uh, obstacle in the course, the pre-programmed robot would have to be taken off the course and reprogrammed, while the IR sensors or the whiskers could just be able to navigate through that obstacle at that time. So the application of our research is between the different, three different sensors, they all have different applications. The IR sensor, since it uses sight mainly, it would not be able to be used in a darker environment and it needs a lot of contrast. For example, our track up here is black and white, so that's got um, great contrast, so that's very well for the IR sensors. And then whiskers, since they use feeling and touch, they would be very useful in a very dark environment where you don't need to see to be able to touch things. And then if you want really consistent results, as Andrea said, you would use pre-programmed ro robots. So in general, this is some actual footage of what we did during the past two weeks. So the first week, we learned initial just basic programming involving pre-programming robots to uh, follow a set path. Uh, later in the week, we began applying our knowledge to use more different types of sensory inputs, sonar, infrared, et cetera. This is a feeler bot that Joe's team used. Um, I think this is a, yep, that's it. So this is the one that did not exactly work. So. One thing that we do need to know is that even though we are dealing with physical robots, which is mainly a hardware thing you would think of, a majority of what we did was actually programming and troubleshooting programming. So it really shows that computer science does pay off. <laughs> so this is actual footage of the IR robot avoiding the uh, obstacles at hand and going through the timer. And this is a point of view from the pre-programmed robot. So um, as you can see, the pre-programmed robot was a little jerky. But overall, it managed to get through with the most consistent time, not the fastest, most consistent. So before we, uh, before we end, I know we're kind of cutting close on time, we have a couple demonstrations of a robot. So we have two demonstrations, and one involves a uh, member of the audience. But before we begin, we'll go ahead and just do the line follower. So while Tanner is demonstrating this, Essentially, the line follower and the secondary infrared robot work on the exact same principle of infrared radiation. Um, underneath that robot, which you can go ahead and turn that on. Underneath that robot, it is designed to use infrared radiation to detect the contrast between the white background and the black line. Using three sensors, it can avoid the line and essentially go around that path. So overall, uh, as you can tell, we used a larger robot because it looks cooler. And once it gets to a background that it was told to avoid, it shuts off and stops. The secondary robot uh, uses the exact same principle, but instead of three sensors, uses two sensors, and it's a bit higher sensitivity. So for this, we are going to be doing something we like to call robot ball on this table. Um, we need one other individual. Uh, instead of choosing a random member of the audience, we talked as a group and decided which person has the best best you know, aspect of athletic experience, uh, history and athletics. So we would like to ask Billy Newell to come down to the stage and help us play robot ball. Is you on the table? So Billy, what grade are you in? I'm an upcoming senior. <laughs> Sounds about right. So essentially, um, I don't know if this is on yet. Okay. So before I actually begin, the way it works is that there are two infrared sensors on the robot. If it senses something here, it avoids this side. And if it senses on something on this side of the robot, it avoids that side. So essentially, for a couple minutes every time, 
we're going to try to pass the robot back and forth just using our hands and not actually touching the robot. You kind of get what we're doing here? No. Okay, sweet. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it kind of works like that, too. <laughs> Oof. Okay, so I'm going to set this down. So. Can I get on that side of the table, Billy? Okay. So essentially, I'm going to start here. Come to the road here. I'm going to get on a straight course towards you. Okay, Billy, you're going. You're going. Okay, try turning around. Try turning around. Okay, sweet, sweet. Oh, you got to use those wizard hands, man. You got to use wizard hands. Okay, sweet. <laughs> So we just have a few people we'd like to thank for everything. First of all, we'd like to mention our three mentors, Vinu Varma, Adam Aaron, and Adam Carroll. They were great with allowing us to come in and use their equipment. And then our facilitators, Carl and Andy in the back. Thank you guys so much for teaching us everything. Shout out to Carl and Andy. Uh, we'd like to thank the Oak Ridge National Laboratory and its fusion and materials for nuclear systems division, the ORAU and the Appalachian Regional Commission, as well as all of our friends from the high school group. It was a great time and we hope to stay in touch throughout the next few years and hopefully the rest of our lives. Thank you.